Good morning, Misfits. You are tuning into another episode of the Misfit Podcast. Drew Sherb and Hunter in the house. DJ Boy. Ted on the mix panel. What's up, yo? Um, we yes. are out of quarantine. If you're watching this on YouTube, if this is on YouTube, um, we're so very sorry that you're upset that we're wearing masks. We have to. It's a mandate. And if we are on video, there's kind of, you know, some pretty easy proof of us sitting here within the building because we're in the gym right now. Um, leadership isn't always fun. We're not like, like stoked, <laughs> like super pumped that we have to wear masks in I a like room. It. Just like the it. Best. part of my face now. It's just become a, a second appendage, third appendage, whatever it is. I don't know how many appendages you have. But <laughs> in this office, in this gym, with a mask, preferred after two weeks of quarantine. Shit, yeah. Very. Yeah. Yep. You guys have any like? Okay. So like, what's you the want depressing best story? <laughs> what's <laughs> the bet? No, I was going positive. What's oh, okay, the best it, part it. of not being in quarantine? Honestly, the uh, like non-exercise movement and just getting moving around outside Larry. my house. Get out of here. <laughs> so just getting moving because again, we talked about this a billion times during the quarantine. It's like, and you know, this past summer, like I walked 15 steps the entire day and I feel like a bag of ass. So I feel a lot better now that I'm up and just getting out of my house. And you're like. Probably should have took Hunter's advice and got up and went for a walk each morning, but just being and moving around and being around other people really makes a huge difference for me. Just Fair. like going to the grocery store when I want to. <laughs> like, fuck, I need to cook something. And I got like like two and a half eggs and some Chef Boy RD or some shit. <laughs> Ooh, Chef Boy RD. We just had a very serious, deep conversation about how many cans of ravioli you could eat. Cause Ted, Ted says he can eat 10 cans of Chef Boy RD. R Ricky ate <laughs> nine cans uh, one night on the Trailer Park Boys. <laughs> And they couldn't figure out where all the ravioli went. He didn't want to tell anyone because he was embarrassed because he ate nine cans of ravioli. So, um, first I don't know. four cans, you know, just uh, go by. It's gonna have my throat. I don't happen. Let's ask, let's ask the listeners how many cans of Chef Boyardee ravioli can you eat? Comment below. <laughs> comment, below. Yeah, comment, comment in cans of ravioli. The funny thing is, this the podcast, if we get there, is about lifestyle. Um, and I, we have a content, we have a ravioli eating contest as part of the podcast. The Chef Boy RD, ravioli. ravioli. We can tell you what's not non-negotiable during competition season, and that is <laughs> ravioli. as many cans ravioli consumption of <laughs> ravioli. <laughs> hey, what if it's like organic? Yeah, that's what I'm ravioli. saying grass-fed ravioli. Grass-fed grass ravioli. <laughs> okay, free-range raviolis. So, what did your raviolis eat? <laughs> we're gonna ask you guys a question, and and we'll we'll talk about it a little bit, but. Sherb worked at a gas station when he was with your teens. convenience store. It wasn't a gas station, to be clear. It's just down the street from my house. K and W convenience. I worked there from like fifteen to like seventeen. And Shout out to the K and W convenience listeners out there, you stand <laughs> by the fact that you ate thirty six Butterfingers in eight hours. Yeah. Not only did you eat them, but you stole them <laughs> from <laughs> your. So, to be clear for the listeners here, I was told I could eat. You know, you could have a, a drink, like grab you could a have soda a or something. Pizza. You could have yeah. a handful of you know Swedish fish from underneath the shelf here, because you sell penny <laughs> penny candy there. So I'd you like can open a bag of Swedish fish and take yeah. a handful and put them back. <laughs> yeah. So I um yeah I might have eaten a Butterfinger every single time I went to the walk-in cooler, which you know you'd go to the cooler like 40, 50 times a day, right? <laughs> Was it a full size? I, I still yeah, don't know what size. box you're, what you've. What you box know when you go to yet? a gas station, convenience store, whatever, and they have that, that oh, cardboard okay. box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so so those have 36 in them, and there's 270 calories in a Butterfinger. Bro, so we're looking like 7, at <laughs> almost 10,000 calories, not only <laughs> 10,000 calories, but in Butterfingers. Yeah, Butterfinger calories don't count. <laughs> they're like they're like Diet Coke. He so vehemently <laughs> stands behind this and has for years Holy that shit. it's gonna be like the dad making the son eat the pack of cigarettes or whatever. <laughs> We're gonna you're gonna sit down. <laughs> I'll eat a pack of cigarettes too. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> the crazy thing is, I feel like you probably could accomplish that. But um, he's filters, like a Billy Goat. He can eat anything first, or <laughs> saving the goods for later. So oh. we are going to. Sit you down for an eight-hour period and see if you can eat 36 Butterfingers. I'm in. How do you think you're going to do? Uh, hopefully better. So there was one time we were on the road where I told Drew I could eat this entire basket of dinner rolls <laughs> at a Brazilian steakhouse. So I proceeded to shove like 12 rolls in my mouth. 
I didn't eat any of them. <laughs> was... We could, we oh, could, God. we could, I get think a... it was five. So, so he thought he could eat a basket of dinner rolls in five minutes. <laughs> and he, his strategy was to put every single dinner roll into his mouth at once. Seems like a right now, strategy. Now this, to me. this gets even better because there's always that twinge of scumbag sherb as part of the story. So I never heard his, that guy. wasn't present his already. Cheeks, <laughs> no, it gets better. Uh, oh, his okay, cheeks were like full squirrel mode. Five minutes passes. He has swallowed nothing. <laughs> nothing. It's just a roll paste in my mouth. Including oxygen. He is, yeah. he is, he, I can't even. I can't even I'm, too, story out. I'm too tired today. Uh. He spit them back into the basket. <laughs> and it covered it. Put a napkin over them and told our waiter <laughs> we didn't want the bread. <laughs> Sorry, mom. <laughs> Hopefully, you're not listening. <laughs> I'm crying over here. God damn and it. And then you said you could eat 10 hot dogs in 10 minutes. I failed that so miserably. So. 50 hot dogs at once. <laughs> There's a really uh, famous hot dog stand <laughs> in Iceland. They call it the Bill Clinton hot dog stand. I think, I think. we call it that. No, 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 they call it that. They definitely call it that. <laughs> But the idea was they put like, you know, s slightly different condiments on there. They were great, right? We had a couple, Ted and I went a, a couple of times, had two or three dogs each time we went. It was great. And I was like, oh, I could fucking put down 10 of these. And they're like, no, you couldn't. So I said, all right, let me try. So we invited one of the campers over who- Iceland's <laughs> strongest, basically world's strongest man. Yeah, that's, that's not fucking the mountain. So he comes over and we go head to head at the table for that. And by the time he had gotten there, all the hot dogs we had ordered had gotten basically cold it was like, snowing it was freezing outside and you were eating hot dogs outside so if you go back and watch that video you'll see me get to like two or three and then i start dry heaving every hot dog i have and he just you know bali just puts them down one after the it other it was but crazy too because he hates onions and ate 10 hot dogs worth of onions in like nine minutes <laughs> it was crazy That's it was nuts hey I, I think i finished shook, shook out at somewhere around six hot so dogs. based on that math about four butterfingers in during your eight hours you're gonna get sick <laughs> and quit I'm ready. Let's or based this. on the dinner rolls, you're going to try to put all 36 <laughs> Butterfingers in your mouth at one time. And you're going to get zero. That box of 36 only <laughs> runs us 29.49 with free well, free prime investment. delivery. What that just got was... slid right into the budget small, for the year. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> Make that work. Maybe we'll christen the new studio. The Butterfingers. With, with sure, the but, butter, but you have them. to hang out for eight hours. We'll just with, do with the We'll raise money. It'll be like a telethon. <laughs> Let's try to raise money for a charity while we'll Sherby's butterfingers. Just have butter a, rotor, a rotary phone in the middle of the studio that we just answer callers, wow. <laughs> answer calls with. I've got some I great ideas today. Call. All right, podcast time. Hope you were entertained by the uh, food Fuck, escapades no, of Sherb. Let's call it there. Let's <laughs> call it short for the week. So we are going to begin. This is actually episode one in a series. We are going to begin a series where we talk about the competition season and specific categories that we were probably going to talk about anyways, sort of in that, like we're, we're crossing the realms of the misfit project and just sort of the regular, you know, unprepared episodes where we look at whether it's today is lifestyle, uh, mindset, you know, how athletes train during the open, whatever it is, we're going to be going through a series where we talk about this stuff and, it shifted just as of a few weeks ago from the open series to the competition season series. And as a like old school jock kind of guy, when I was growing up, like this idea makes a lot more sense to me than what we were dealing with before. Like the competition season, the idea of an athlete, things are just different in your life when you're an athlete, when you're in season, you know, when you've got practice and games and all that <clears> stuff. So this is definitely something I would say that's more in my wheelhouse just from like uh, maybe understanding what it's like standpoint. And I think it's really good for our sport and a really good sort of progression to get us to a point where, you know, there was years ago when, when CrossFit was first on CBS, it was like a similar size in certain ways to like the UFC and was being compared to the UFC in a certain way. But then when, Glassman decided that none of this like matters anymore and all that happened, it sort of fell by the wayside. And obviously we know what the UFC has turned into now. Um, so just the idea of the legitimacy of the sport, the idea of like getting more people involved because that's what we want 
at the end of the day anyways, whether it's because we want to be entertained by the sport or if it's because, you know, we want more people to be healthier, come into the affiliates, whatever it is. Yeah, to me, the uh, <clears throat> that competition season and what the athlete has to do versus what they can do potentially or get away with outside of the season is very interesting because, you know, most of the people that we work with are typically what we call like CrossFit games, like lifers, even if they aren't going to compete at the CrossFit games, they follow the Misfit blog. They're just someone who's very serious about training and typically takes certain things very seriously, how their sleep is, how their nutrition is and all that stuff. And there's a common question that we get from athletes is like, all right, is, is it okay to take a break or is it okay to take like the hands off the or feet off the gas pedal for a little bit? And what goes, what should I be able to do during that period? And what not, why shouldn't I be able to do in that period? And honestly, it depends a great deal on the athlete, but to me, it's a very interesting topic because one thing we deal with quite often with athletes is that, hey, I've had these 36 weeks of just being on all the time. Like, how do I recharge my battery and get myself ready to go? Because that that's a hard thing to accept as an athlete is, hey, it's okay to take a week or two to take it easy, recover, rest, get out of the gym, do other things for a little bit, and then hopefully like respark that fire again. So when the season's you know coming back up, you're hungry and ready to go get after it versus like, you know what, maybe this is my off season or I'm going to do a year of Olympic weightlifting or I'm going to go try something else for a little bit. Yeah, that's and kind of at the affiliate. We, we see that a lot with athletes who get like really ramped up about something or maybe they were outside of the gym for a week or two. Like we were closed for a couple of weeks recently and then uh, the mentality becomes like, oh, I'm going to like make up for lost time. Almost. Wax like I'm going <laughs> to, I'm just going to haze myself for the next week and like, you know, the, the net sum, you know, will balance back, balance itself back out. And we apply, you can apply the same thing to the, the longer season and the competitive athlete. And there has to be, there has to be the ebb and flow of, of kind of varying degrees of intensity and, and focus. Otherwise, you know, if you're, if you're always on, you're never on. And if you're never on, you're, you know, exactly. you're never on. So to, so to speak. So the question of the day with the first competition season series in terms of lifestyle is what are the non-negotiable lifestyle habits and routines for serious athletes when they're in season? Like what are the things that, and, and I do have some structure to this episode, but just to make sure that we, you know, sort of go into each thing, um, for you guys, I want to start with, I want to hear your opinions on like when it comes to personal life, mm. like, I'm talking day to day personal relationships, like sort of leaving aside the things that are, are easier to measure. Like what, what sort of things should serious athletes be thinking about when it comes to this? You know, you listen to like, I think Matt's been on a couple of podcasts recently about this exact topic and that what his wife and his support team allows him to get away with, with his training and a couple of things that they say right off the bat, that's non-negotiable is, Hey, you know, if you're going to have a situation that allows you to be the best athlete you can be, you need to have people around you that allow you to do that. So like one thing I th think of right off the bat is like surround yourself with positive people who are not maybe not necessarily your peers and like trying to do the same thing you're trying to do, but can see what you're after and can help you in that regard because it's, it takes a village to get one of these athletes to the, you know, the, the games or get them to the high level sanctionals or whatever their, you know, their apex of their sport is for them, but it does take a support staff. So, I mean, for me, non-negotiable is making sure that people that are around you understand what you're after and, you know, essentially empathize and want to help you on that path because it's difficult enough without creating additional problems. Like someone saying, Hey, you're taking too much time away from us and what we can do or hey i don't want to go eat that grass-fed steak for the third day in a row like can we do something else so to me the, right off the bat it's just making sure <clears throat> that the support staff around you kind of understands what you're after and where you're going and they can kind of support you in whatever way makes the most sense for you you just don't want those negative detractors around you while you're trying to get yourself you know to where you're trying to go right? yeah i think it's my idea is right along those same lines and probably almost the same thing uh, but it's, it's kind of setting expectations and expectation management. It has to, there has to be an understanding between you and as the athlete and your support staff, whether that's a husband, wife, kids, or, you know, even, even like if you're a, a single athlete and then there, maybe there's an understanding with your gym or your, your affiliate owner and the coaches and whatever, and, and just trying to kind of, you have to set the stage for what you can, uh, or what you are trying to get over the next couple weeks, couple months or whatever, and making sure that the people that 
you know, are going to be directly impacted by you are, are aware of that and are on the same page so that you don't have to worry about that. Because like you said, it's, that's not something that you want to like, <clears throat> not that you would like hide it or, from somebody, but if you're not, if you're not transparent about what the, what the goals are and then <clears throat> what the requirements therefore become of you as an athlete. And then maybe like, Hey, these are things that in my home that might fall by the wayside or might become like, Hey, I'm going to, I need some help, uh, so that I don't have to worry about this. I'm asking for your help to do this and, you know, setting up some sort of just expectation so that you don't have that tension. Because if you don't, if you don't set that up, uh, and it, you're again, let's just assume it's a spouse, a spouse doesn't understand the time commitment and the requirement and like, why are you going to bed at, you know, nine o'clock every single night? Like, why are we, why, why are you eating the same thing every single day? Like, you know, we're not eating at the same time for dinner because of our work schedules are different. Like all of these things can add a ton of additional stress that eventually just detract from the goal, regardless of how good of like quality all the individual things are. If you don't have that underlying support, um, it's you're you're gonna fail you have enough stress in your life why do you want to add another layer like that's the way i look at it and you'll see a lot of these high level competitors they have a very small circles for that exact same reason the additional noise or the possibility for someone to create distraction or to create additional stress is just not something they're willing to deal with so you do see some athletes that around peaking season around a high level are like my network's these seven people and like outside of that when I'm making my money, that's that's all I need. I don't need to be going to the movie theater. I don't need to be going out to dinner. I don't need to be doing this, that, or the other because I, I have a goal in mind and these things aren't things that take me one step closer. They might take me one step down a different path, which isn't the path that I'm after. And that has to be also has to be an honest assessment of, of what your goals are and where you're gonna go. If you if you're somebody who come came in, you know, five thousandth in the open, are you legitimately going to going to be training for to go to a semifinal like an in-person semifinal like maybe maybe not but you have to evaluate that and kind of make that part of your communication process with your support staff and don't don't bullshit it either like that that could be super stressful somebody you know i figure out so and so is is kind of not not that anybody would like milk it but like hey i you do not have a chance to go to the CrossFit games this year, like you're putting unnecessary stress on yourself and the rest of us. And it's, and it's detracting from, from like the bigger picture. So an honest assessment of what your goals are and what you can realistically achieve also uh, should be part of that conversation. Yeah, I mean, the timeline's important because you're right. There might be yeah. athletes who are saying to themselves, yeah, I realize that like I might, it might appear that I'm being selfish right now, or I'm doing these things. Maybe I, I don't have the right, the right framework. Maybe I need a coach or I need a peer to talk to that say, Hey, you know, I, I really do want to go compete at this X level. What are the steps to get there? And, you know, with a coach, you can go back and forth and say, all right, these are the things you need to be doing that are important, but like also give the people around you a pass or give them some, some leeway or some breaks because you're know, like, sometimes athletes just don't have realistic expectations of how fast they can develop. And it might be, Hey, this is going to be a few seasons worth of work before we get there. And if you can create that expectation, yeah. that'll again, a relieve some term. stress because some people are like instant gratification. I didn't get it this year. Well, fuck, throw the papers up. I'm done. Let's do something else. And a lot of times if you had just had a conversation with another peer or a coach, you might kind of see the journey that they've been on or maybe have their past experience to say, all right, like I'm not going to qualify this year, but I'm going to build some habits that are going to help me qualify the next year, the year after that. Right. This is the kind of topic that I think because it's not quantitative is the kind of thing that could move the needle more for athletes than any of the other topics we talk about mm. today, because those other things are being measured. They're being looked at. They get sort of maybe even immediate feedback on, I ate this. I feel this way. I did this recovery protocol. I feel this way. I set my alarm for this time and so on. Whereas your personal life you know, is just so many tiny moments that add up over a period of time. It's, and, yeah. you know, listening to the, to Fraser on the, the Darren Woodson podcast, I feel like most people wanted to fast forward in part two until he said him and Froning haven't talked in two years, but there is so much in that. gold throughout that, you know, it's, it's in two different parts. It's, you know, I, I'm sure he's on everywhere where you can get podcasts. I watched it on, I had it up on YouTube and that is one of the reasons why we consistently talk about these people, whether they're misfit athletes or not, is because, you know, three coaches sitting in a room talking about this stuff, 
you know, moves the needle, let's say for 60 to 70% of the people that are listening to it, the best person to ever do something talks about it and how seriously he takes it. And that, that finishes, you know, the, you know, takes it to the, (laughs) takes it to the 90, 95% range. Now, what you guys addressed, what Hunter, what you started to address is the other side of the coin, which matters just as much. The people in his life are supporting true greatness. 100%. He is getting what he gives. He is, he is saying, okay, see you, do you see how hard I work? Do you see that I go and compete against everyone else who's the best at this in the entire world and they're not even in the same realm as I am? So for me, whether it's understanding that from a day-to-day standpoint or like you guys talked about, maybe more on a, on a schedule, in life, you are going to get what you give. So if you're the type of person, you're, you're going to have to interact with people that are not in your inner circle in life. That's just the way that it is. Um, if you are you know, like talking to people, you're mean to people, you're rude. You're like, I'm doing, get away from me. I'm doing this or I'm doing that. That's the kind of energy that's going to come back to you. And you can't expect every single person to understand exactly what you're trying to do. So one of the best ways for this to happen is to reciprocate this kind of idea. Yeah, put it out into to, the world yourself. Exactly. <laughs> put out good energy because there's a really good chance. You know, mm-hmm. we've got, we've got a handful of coaches here that just, exude that they put that sort of energy out there and then surprise surprise you talk to a member and they're like i love taking so-and-so's class they just give that they put that out there and they get it back they get that sort of thing so i think yes you need to clarify with all of these people in your life like it's gonna seem like i'm selfish but if you really want to continue to complete that circle you also yourself have to be thankful you have to you know make sure that those people know if they are making sacrifices with you that you appreciate it and just in general in stupid interactions at the grocery store at a checkout counter anywhere like that's the kind of stuff that stresses you out when some random person's mean to you and you're like what the fuck what i do (laughs) the world sucks i hate this what the hell's going on like if you're the type of person that's, you know, smiling or no, you go first or thank you so much or eye contact or whatever it is, you're going to receive those things back. Yeah. And all of this, as you'll see by the end of the episode, if it isn't clear already, comes back to the same place. I mean, just imagine imagine being the athlete at the gym who people are so uh, nervous to go up to because they they see you as the either a standoffish person or just somebody who's so intense that they don't possibly have time for you and so they're never interacting with you and you are you are effectively putting yourself on your own island whereas if you are that person who's like yeah when i'm training like i need i'm in game game time mode but once i i, I have that switch and i can flip it and i can be a person and i can talk to you and then those people are super interested in what you're doing and they're like nobody's going to be like wow like you didn't do very well at that did you it's going to odds are if you're a competitive if you're a competitive athlete and do you know are are even even reasonably good and and but have these outward goals these people are going to be there to support you and exactly. it becomes kind of this positive feedback loop like you know regardless of how you actually perform if you are a kind like nice person people are going to see that people are going to do the same to you and it's just going to result in uh and just positive feedback. When Made we talk about the- how, how stressful training is, like why wouldn't you want the occasional attaboy from the random person who walks in your gym and just sees you working hard? Like we all talk about the the dog days of the winter when it's fucking February 1st and you're the only person in here doing bar facing burpees and thrusters and, and a, closed, a closed gym by yourself. Like it's hard to get up and get that energy. So like, you know, if you put out positivity in the universe around the people who are that come in and interact with you on a daily basis, you never know how that one attaboy or girl you get some random Wednesday is going to be like, oh, you know what? I was having a bad day, but that one thing made a difference, and now it's able to do the next training piece I had. Or it makes the ability to go make a good nutrition choice very easy. Or, hey, you know what? I'm doing the right things because people are you know rooting for me. Those things come back to you kind of like tenfold the way I like to think about it. So every time you do something nice for somebody else, it's a good chance you're going to see that reciprocated in your life. Rule number one for being a New Zealand All Black, like, the most winning sports team in like world history is don't be a dick like rule number one to be to be on that yeah those are some bad motherfuckers too so you can see how powerful (laughs) someone could be if they were a bad motherfucker and they were nice yeah (laughs) yeah
Dude, speaking of that side tangent, there something like Amazon is trying to buy like 25% of their team and it's like two, three or $4 billion. The All Blacks? Yes. There's some equity firm or Amazon or someone that is trying to buy them. And when I saw the price for the percentage, I was like, it's like more than the fucking Cowboys. What? <laughs> is this real? Like, I could not believe it. I also, Hunter's while Hunter, out. while Hunter's doing research, I also have <laughs> another rant. Um, when it comes to this topic, especially based on the, the DMs that I get after the episodes, um, and please keep doing that. I, I like communicating with you guys is there is not only a virus pandemic going on right now, but there's also a mental health pandemic that's going on right now. And just to, to tie this together, if you are trending into or in that, or have already been in that category of, of anxiety, depression, stress, those things, the most immediate thing that, that comes to mind that is missing. And it's so obvious right now, even though we've been talking about it for years is we evolved in groups of people. And I'm guessing in the cave, it wasn't easy to hide things from people, right? They knew what was going on with you. They knew your moods. They knew what it was like. They knew what you were like all the time because you were around them all the time. Like that's just how it was. We evolved in ways where everyone knew what was going on with us. We knew what was going on with everyone else. And when that gets shut off, when you take your personal stories, when you take your moods, when you take all of these things and internalize them and hide in a room with Netflix or your cell phone or whatever it is, and then just hope that you can make it through your eight hours in public with a happy <laughs> face, that is going to create a negative feedback loop that is going to be a serious problem. Now, just saying you have to talk to people is really fucking hard. Um, obviously, it's not easy for people to do or they would already be doing it. But you don't want it to get so bad that you're forced into that situation. So all I can say is if you're really struggling right now, try to think about it from the standpoint of start sharing more with people that you trust. Ask them to share more. Get some sort of reciprocating thing going on. You don't have to go first day and say, you know, I have clinical depression. You can just say I'm having a shitty day or this is really hard. Have you just, you know, it has this been hard for you, that sort of thing. So um, while not, you know, completely on brand with, you know, lifestyle habits of the serious athlete, there's, there's nothing to say that at serious athletes don't struggle from that. And then basically anyone. I mean, we've seen people like Michael podcast. Phelps and a bunch of other high level athletes who talk about, Hey, you're at the absolute pinnacle of your sport. How can you be depressed? You have millions of dollars and fame and cars and that affect everybody. Like everybody deals with it in different ways. And obviously some people have it a lot worse than others. Some right. people outwardly show they're depressed and some people hold that stuff in. But, you know, being vulnerable and willing to say to somebody, um, we all typically have one person in the world that we can kind of connect with and at least talk to a little bit. Talk to them about something and have it start, like you said, very innocuous. Have it be a conversation about, did you see this Netflix show? And just try to create that conversation because it's that personal connection that like, sort of alluded to in the beginning of the podcast that I'm so excited about being back in the gym is just, you know, I never, again, looked at myself as someone who is extroverted in terms of like, I want to go out to social scenes, but I am an extrovert. I like to be around other people and I find that I feel better when I'm around other people. So creating the opportunity to have those conversations, starting someplace that's very safe for you is a really easy way to kind of work into them because a lot of people, I'm sure I probably get a little anxiety, like, he said, talk to somebody about my problems and I don't know how to like start very simple. Talk about the weather, talk about things that are easy and then kind of work your way into something like that. It's hard. The, the intangibles are, are so important. Like I'm, I'm sure we'll get into the nuts and bolts of the, the sleep and the nutrition and stuff like that. But CrossFitters, I think inherently have that type a personality uh, a little bit more rigid. They like, uh, in a way like predictability and routine and stuff like that. And, and it, those things are a lot easier to measure. Like we can measure our training, we can measure our macros, we can measure our sleep, we can measure the quality of it with, with these, with these wearables and everything. But when it comes to like, what's the quality of my, my relationships or my stress or my, you know, like you said, interaction with other people and, and mental health, those things are a lot less tangible and therefore more difficult to measure. Um, 
and, and we see it with people who who are just super dialed in like they know exactly what training pieces they're going to hit every single day their sleep is perfect their nutrition is dialed into the macro and yet they're still super stressed or they really struggle and and it, it's because we're forgetting that those intangibles the relationship life the stress, <laughs> the li exactly yeah the the human condition so to speak yeah two billion dollars for 15 percent right what the hell yeah. american private equity investor uh the 12 it? billion it plus Ooh, you know what the amazon one Sil was silver lake four billion dollars to to broadcast italian soccer on prime Ooh. Yeah, yeah. How can these guys, How can these, guys these guys also own Manchester <laughs> City or part of it. Fifteen percent. I'm here to offer you. 15 I don't know anything about soccer, but I do know that they completely investment. turned around Man City. Man City was a joke. I do, and yeah. got clobbered by Manchester United every time they played. Now it's the whole thing. And the only reason I know that is because I used to be obsessed with Ricky Hatton, the boxer, <laughs> and he was obsessed with Man City. <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, sleep. You guys know you guys know the, the prescription and the whole thing, but um, before I either agree with you or correct you, what do you what do you got? What Damn, are the son? Yeah, well, what is a no, what are non negotiables for a serious athlete when it comes to sleep? Pick non one. Non negotiable. Non negotiable has to happen. Nine hours in bed every night. You got one? I mean that one. <laughs> no, so there's nothing for, else. I heard you. I mean, should should okay, they assuming, should they set an alarm three and a half hours in and shotgun a a bang energy? Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> Diet Pepsi. You don't do that? Stay hydrated. <laughs> Diet Pepsi and a lemon. Ted uh, knows. Ted knows the joke there. <laughs> the Mountain Dew chug in the middle of the night. We had a God. friend who did that. Oh, that's crazy. Savage. God. Do you have any teeth? Yeah. So <laughs> does he have any teeth? <laughs> he might not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no teeth can confirm. <laughs> assuming, assuming we're getting in bed long enough to get that like five to sips, five to sips, Ooh. five to six. Oh, You're just thinking Mountain about Mountain Dew now. Mountain Dew and Diet Mountain Pepsi. Dew. <laughs> five to six sleep cycles. Uh, then it it goes into the quality. Uh, for me personally, it's the blackout curtains. Like yep. I sleep like a baby and all of a sudden like on a weekend it's 9 a.m and my room's completely black and i'm like ah yeah five more hours to sleep and but it's 9 a.m so <laughs> i mean you I'm only a, need to be in room. a vacation like on vacation once where you're just in a room that has no windows and you're like whoa yeah you go into <laughs> a hotel and you close like the 38 come out a month later <laughs> and and like the air conditioning and i just remember we went to dubai once and went to like i was oh. a little jet lag <laughs> yeah i slept until like 4 p.m <laughs> i went to bed at like 10 p.m and slept at four the next day or when something i didn't just... see you at all i legitimately just thought you had gone and done like woke up super early and gone and done something else i went to bed at 10 p.m and slept till like 4 p.m the next day because i was so messed up from the flight and i was just like i got up and i was like what what year is it where, where am i and ever no one was around and I eventually found everybody at the pool and they're like where have you been they're like i was sleeping like man fuck sleep a long ass time all right so we got so what hunter is addressing is is what we would call sleep hygiene yeah. it's essentially how are you setting up the things around you um so when it comes to sleep hygiene light is probably a number one temperature is going to be you know one a or one b or two and basically you cannot get into that third layer of sleep. You cannot get into deep sleep if your body temperature doesn't drop down. Um, so that's why you hear recommendations of both take a bath before you go to bed so that your temperature drop has more velocity on it. That's one school of thinking. Hmm. Another is a, that, that, that has worked for a ton of people that I've talked to is just the lukewarm, you know, sort of cool shower before you go to bed, you sort of start that process there. So both of those things can work. Um, but it's really important to get into that and, and to touch on the sleep cycles for anyone that hasn't heard us rant about this before. Basically you're going through 90 minute sleep cycles and the more that you make it into and get into that deep sleep that we're talking about, the more testosterone and growth hormone your body produces. Literally free steroids, the more you free sleep. steroids. And it's funny because people only think of supplements or, you know, like full yeah. on steroids when it's that stuff. But this, this is all, it wouldn't work if it wasn't a naturally occurring thing in our bodies. And I was talking to this, we have a, a, a bit of a, a teen phenom in the gym right now. And he is still working with the machinery where he can sleep for 90 seconds and <laughs> his HRV is 10,000 and he's doing blah, blah, blah. But he's trying to get stronger right now. He's, you know, one of the big things with him, he's got the motor and he's trying to get stronger right now. And it's like, 
every time you make it into another one of those, you know, portions, you get more testosterone, more growth Pour hormone. A little bit more Ex- exactly, on. right? So his <laughs> nervous system is, like is responding very well. Pound on your back squat. Yeah. Keep going. <laughs> so it's one of those things where it's like I, you know, I ask him like once a month, has Hunter convinced you to sleep more yet? And he's like, kind of. Like so that that part of things I is, told him that on day one and I kind of threatened him. I don't know if he's like <laughs> he sleeps with a knife in his hand. Yeah. He's just with <laughs> a gun under his pillow. Like <laughs> just sleeping with a knife You're in his hand. You're not there, but he sees your head in the window. Good. <laughs> That's not creepy at all. Um so I, I think this leaves one that doesn't get talked about quite enough, and that is oh. circadian rhythm. Oh, I um, change my answer. Athletes need to wake up and go to sleep at the exact same time five and a half to seven days a week we know life happens things happen but if you want to get into those sleep cycles if you want your body to respond in the right ways you absolutely have to set your circadian rhythm and the closer you get to you know i'm kind of awake when it's light and i'm asleep when it's dark that's better you can shift a couple of hours but basically every human being has a schedule set in their DNA that only fluctuates like an hour or two. So when you talk to someone who's like a night owl, the research says that that's like maybe 10 or 11 PM is the absolute like latest that, that your sleep clock might have started. And it does change throughout your life. So I am talking more about an adult right now. Um, when you're a kid, you need more sleep. Typically, you want to go to bed a little bit or you want to go to bed a little bit later, wake up a little bit later. But as you get older, there aren't, there isn't a ton of fluctuation when it comes to this. So this is one of those things that's really important. Um, and the science behind all of this that leads us into, I don't know if you were going to talk about morning movement or any of the sort of the morning stuff, but our bodies need cortisol, the stress hormone when we wake up in the morning, but, that runs throughout the day in an inverse relationship with melatonin. We've talked about this a million times, but basically if you don't get up and see the sun or, you know, an artificial light source that, that, that mimics the sun and move around a little bit, you are, you have a less, you know, a lower chance of your cortisol really kind of spiking when it's supposed to in the morning. And then it can spike and sort of stay constant a bit more throughout the day. Um, so that's one of the main reasons why we've added morning movement to the blog we want people to get up and to move. So sort of the new non-negotiable in competition season concept with this is you need to get up at the same time every day. If, you know, like, I'm not going to lie. A lot of times I'm just looking out the window at the sun because it's 19 degrees. Um, <laughs> and for anyone outside of the United States, that's negative, I don't know, 10. 15. 300 degrees yeah. Celsius. It's not, it's not nice. Negative 300 degrees. Um, Kelvin. And then you just got to move a little bit and it's nothing crazy. Like if, if you're, you know, a affiliate level athlete, you can stare out the window while you're drinking your water and knock out 10 burpees and you're, you're good to go. You're just letting your body know that you're awake so that your stress levels can go down throughout the day. And then your melatonin can be produced and your body's kind of naturally falling asleep. What's nice too about that version versus the, there are people who are like, all right, get up and just pound coffee. First thing is that you don't create the exact same type of cortisol spike and you have artificially are putting yourself in this alert state that your body's not quite ready for. So like, you know, we've, I know you've heard you say this to Caroline specifically and me a couple of times because I was one of those guys that eyes weren't even open and I already was already like three cups deep in my face and you were like, Good. get up and move first. Let your body do its what its due process. Let it get up and get an hour of like awakening, awakening itself. And if you can elevate that naturally without artificial, you know, intake, aka caffeine via ca- coffee, you're going to be in a better, better situation so that you can get into that routine at the end of the day. Because that's a, probably the more common concern with people is that like, depending on what you do with your life, you might have a job that puts you in this like fight or flight state, or it's stressful all the way up until an hour and a half before bed. And you're like, how do I, how do I allow myself to like wind down? And how do I get myself ready for sleep? Because it's a, something I deal with quite often with athletes at the affiliate level. It's like, yeah, yeah, I hear sleep's great, sleep's great, sleep's great. But at like 9 PM, 10 30, I'm still wide awake. And then you ask them what are their habits leading up to it? So like, 100% agree, like get up, get moving, spike that cortisol. But this your night of sleep starts again, like the day before starts the night yeah, yeah. before, like how do you get yourself ready for sleep? So, you know, 
Another thing I would say is for a serious athlete is figuring out what your evening routine is to allow yourself, you know, now that your melatonin is starting to rise and your cortisol is starting to drop, what is that like behavior or habit you start to put yourself in that says, all right, like it's time to wind down. And what's kind of cool about the new like iOS app is there's like a nighttime reminder, like, hey, it's time to like get ready for bed. So if you're someone, you know, needs that reminder, it's like, all right, time to turn electronics off, time to get away from apps, time to, you know, turn all the lights off, put the candles on, get myself ready to sleep, stretch, those type of things. Candles. Like, there are people who do that, man. Get away from that blue light. But uh, I love candles. I take a lot nice. of baths. Uh, I just I listen to Coldplay. Keep going. But I was just going to say, like, <laughs> think, if, you're, if you're someone that's struggling with any of this, you're like, yeah, I know all this stuff is great, but I really struggle with it. Start looking at some of those habits first thing in the morning and first thing, or right before bed, because those are probably the reason why you're struggling with some of the, you know, Drew was saying like non-negotiables, black, cold, you know, um, maybe a sound machine to give you some, you know, white noise. But if you struggle with sleep still, maybe you're not addressing the things that are happening first thing in the morning and right before bed. And that's the reason why you're not getting what you could get out of sleep. All right, Misfits, just a quick break to thank our show sponsors and save you guys a little bit of dough. We are brought to you by Proper Fuel. Head to properfuel.co and purchase you a jug of proper recovery. Um, I'm actually for the ad today going to read a direct message that we got about Proper Fuel today. Proper Fuel is easily the best product I've used. Everything else, either one, makes my stomach hurt, two, tastes terribly, or three, doesn't work. Now, that's probably the, the simplest way to explain the things that we were trying to accomplish, right? So makes my, <laughs> yeah, make, makes my stomach hurt. So whey protein does bother a lot of people. There's a lot of different routes that you can go to try and fix this. We went with a more broken down version, whey protein isolate, and we put a dig digestive enzyme in there to help you process that. Um, Honestly, it's it's one of those things that was was very important to us in the formulation, but it has been sort of the star of the show since the product has been released because, you know, you try really hard in the formulation and you test it and you work on it, but we've gotten such great feedback from the general public. So just knowing that we've made a product where people can actually consume the way without it, you know, sort of hurting, making things worse is great. Um, the taste thing, we just... Oh, yeah wanted it to taste good nailed it boom roasted <laughs> and then the doesn't work thing like we want people to notice a difference when they train really hard and then drink the shake the recovery how they feel are they as sore all that good stuff so um thank you lexi for sending that message over properfuel.co use the code word misfit to save on your first order we are also brought to you by Pure Spectrum CBD. Head to PureSpectrumCBD.com and use the code word MISFIT to save a little green. As we talked about in the episode today, one of the things that's going to help you recover and be a better athlete is that sleep. If you have a sleep hygiene and a sleep habit, you know, protocol to get yourself into that you know, I'm time to go to, you know, go to bed and get calm and get relaxed. Um, for me personally, that includes putting, you know, a couple drops of the uh, 2,500 milligram black label CBD uh, tincture underneath my tongue. I do that. I head to the bathroom, do the brushing of the teeth, get ready for bed. It really just kind of set me up for a really nice night of sleep. So again, head to PureSpectrumCBD.com. Use the code word MISFIT. Check out that tincture. We are also brought to you by Sharpen the Axe. You know what? You guys know what, like the, you know why the All Blacks have the, one of the winningest percentages in like sports history? It's because they look fucking good. Like those black uniforms are just fucking dope. You're, you're not I'll wrong. You, like look good, feel good, play good. Sharpentheaxeco.com just had a nice little drop, including some of those blue joggers, which I couldn't like scroll through like a handful of Instagram messages. And it was just like most comfortable joggers I ever wore, like best joggers on the market all that sort of stuff. Head to sharpentheaxeco.com, scoop yourself up some of the stuff that was just dropped. Use the code word unprepared to save a little bit of dough on the order or use the code word Kiala, K-E-A-L-A, -A, to have some of your order donated to the Kiala Foundation. We got to bring up Misfit Athletics, right? So if you're listening nope. to this, if you're listening <laughs> to this podcast, you like what you're hearing, you like the vibe, you like the science mixed with the raviolis and the butterfingers <laughs> and all that good stuff. There's a lot of science. <laughs> There's a lot of science behind that. If you want to follow ravioli. the programming, we believe in it so much that basically everywhere you go, you can try it out for two weeks for free. Sugar Wad Marketplace, teammisfit.com for your affiliate programming, misfitathletics.com, two week free trial. Train with us, improve, be part of a community, be part of a family. Uh, we don't think you'll regret it.
All right, back to the episode. <laughs> yeah. I was going to add the evening routine thing. That was my other. Yeah. Uh, One of the reasons I, I think the evening routine thing is the perfect segue to we're going to talk about stress a little bit right now. Um, when, when we talk about stress, let's say it's uh, someone who's coming into the affiliate and just wants to talk about health and well-being. We're going to recommend things like taking walks or meditating or, you know, doing long, slow cardio that Journal, sort of thing. Journaling. Journaling. There's, there's a lot of stuff that's there, but the common theme here and the sort of end result that you're after is serious athletes cannot be on every second that they're awake, right? Like you cannot be mentally and or physically stimulated at a high level throughout the entire day. It's a no-go. Um, we've talked about this plenty before. We've got the, the misfit, the shirt, um, fill the tank, empty the tank. And it's really important to understand that you only have one gas tank when it comes to energy, whether that's physical or mental. We are pulling from our own resources anytime we're doing something that takes effort, okay? That could be your job, that could be writing, that could be you know, having a super intense conversation with someone. When you're using mental or physical resources, you are taking away from the amount of energy that you're going to have. And we need to have a, like an energy balance, right? Mm -hmm. Some people like to do this based on feel, sort of like the sleep. Some people like to know what their sleep score was the night before so that it is quantitative. Some people get stressed and lay awake all night and then their sleep score is trash because they want to know what their sleep score was. <laughs> um, so that's why I didn't bring it up as a non-negotiable. It has different effects on different people. Um, but when you're looking at things like HRV, and recovery protocols and all this stuff, the overall feeling again that you're after is that you're not on every second. It's just not realistic. I know that it's basically life for almost everyone who's listening to this podcast, but if you are a serious athlete and you're doing this to yourself, if you're going from task to task to task and trying to jam in all of these other things and doing your training, you are not going to have the same results as you would if you gave yourself breaks. And hey, you apply it. Uh, at the beginning of the podcast, we talked about it. You don't, you're butterfingers. You're, you're <laughs> how many butterfingers to get recovered? 36 Got it. a day. Um, you can't, you, you can't be on your, your competition season is not 52 weeks long. It's not the entire year. You can't be expected to be performing at the, the highest level that entire, that entire year. There has to be that ebb and flow. And then you, you just shrink that down into the day and it has to apply as well. And uh, understanding that everybody has different, different, jobs that, that have varying levels of stress. Um, I think that there, you have to kind of establish with yourself. And I think that there's just a lot of, a level of self-discipline that's required and, and just willingness to like, make sure that is part of your daily routine is just having a, a time or like a threshold event or something like that, that, that signals like, okay, it, it's time to like turn it down regardless of what's going on to the best of your ability. If you have a chaotic, chaotic job, you know, it's as soon as you get in the car, it's a quiet ride home. And like that, that is the signal to your body that, that, you know, it's like, okay, we're done with that now. And now we, we come down because stress and, and, we talk about it a lot. Stress is important. It's an important, it's, it's just as bad to have, to be completely relaxed and have zero stress. We have that, you know, the two nervous systems and the balance is super important that we go from that fight or flight down to the rest and digest and back and forth. And that's healthy. Um, and it, we could, you know, we could talk about everybody's probably been through some form of quarantine and like how relatively like little that they probably did for a period of time and how, how similar that is to yeah we know that side of the coin's busy. not good either yeah, yeah. <laughs> we always talk about like oh i'm gonna disappear and live in a cabin in the woods and no one's gonna bother me <laughs> it's like you're gonna be miserable in a week yeah <laughs> so like we, a day we, or two. we have to have that you have to have that ebb and flow within the day as well um and, and kind of have those markers that signal like okay like day's going like i'm going i'm going i'm going and then probably more importantly for our purposes that end point right i mean you talked about this quite a few times during the in the past but like if you really want to get all you can from your training yeah you need the stress from exercise but it's the recovery from that said stress that allows you to do that and you were talking about like getting free supplements that free testosterone and growth hormone the best way to get away from getting those things is to be stressed out 24 yeah. seven. So it's important, like Hunter was saying a second ago, you have two nervous systems. It's important to have both of them kind of firing equally. And you know, those 
trackers like Whoop or some of the other Aura Rings or other ones that are great for kind of measuring your HRV that you know how you're doing with those, you know, both those nervous systems because that number's low, you know one of them's out of whack. So you can kind of track those things and see what helps you. But if you really want to get every ounce you can from your training, you have to be able to turn it off and relax. And that includes both getting good quality sleep and finding ways to manage your stress and knowing that your way of managing stress may not be the same as Drew Hunter eyes. It could be different for you, but figuring out what that is and what you enjoy is going to allow you to get more from your training. So you might feel like, you know what, why does sitting quietly and reading this book help me become a better athlete? It's because it's getting you out of the headspace of like, or fuck, I didn't go fast enough on my thrusters and wall balls today. Like it gets you away from that. And if that could, works for you, don't look at it as less than or better than somebody else's. It's just your version of doing it and knowing that it's cool to have a different way to to relax like i know you specifically like to walk in the woods with your dogs like that's a great way to do it might not have a dog but there, i'm sure there are other ways for you to sit to quietly maybe you know find one of those headspace apps or something like that and my dogs that like thing. to walk are very old oh, so sometimes yeah, it's sometimes dogie. it's a podcast <laughs> and no dog but i get you know i get out there yeah basically that what i was trying to say is you have permission to find your best way to do this and some people are like oh someone said i had to meditate or do you know this protocol or that protocol find what works for you. And it's going to be different for everybody. Some people get, some people get re-energized in very small groups. So like you were saying earlier, just chatting, shooting the shit. And some people need that quiet time alone, reading a book or, you know, meditating in a corner. Right. The one thing that, that came to mind when you were talking about that is, and, and this one is almost one of those like devastating things. Like, like when an athlete trains really hard and has some other way to like self-sabotage, if you do get that sleep and you do produce all that testosterone, but you're super stressed in a riding that cortisol level throughout the entire day, your body's not really going to be able to, from a hormonal level, utilize the testosterone to do what it's supposed to do. So it's one of those things where you can almost self-sabotage these things that you're trying to do if you're not looking at the big picture. If you're not trying to get, you know, if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, I'm not a serious athlete, you can try to start picking out one habit from each category and trying to start from one of those positions because it's very easy to, you know, you can obviously eat your way out of bad training or good training, right? You can eat yourself into, you know, damn, I'd have to train, you know, nine times a day to be able to get the same benefit. Whereas if I just fueled properly, I could, you know, cut my training in half. So that, that to me is super important. And then from like a, a, a super practical standpoint, I think a serious athlete does need to, have like this as part of their to-do list. I personally need it scheduled in because otherwise I'll blast through the day and then go, oops. <laughs> um, so, you know, I have to have, my phone tells me to meditate at the same time every single day. And I don't always get to meditate then, but I don't get rid of the reminder. So it stays in my notification screen. And it's just sort of a like, like I'm the kind of person I probably meditate five out of seven days, somewhere in that range. Um, I, I do wish it was seven out of seven days, but it's one of those things where if, if I have that there, I'm good. Um, if I tell myself, okay, I've got, you know, five work tasks, I'm going to take a 10 minute walk between each one. That's the sort of thing that works for me. So it depends on whether you're like a super regimented person, you should work those into your actual schedule. Or if you're just a more of a generalist, I'm going to get these things done when I get them done. It, I think it's still important to find systematic ways to get them into your routine. Yeah, it's always nice to have that little reward. Like you get, you have something that has to be done and then you give yourself a little real break or a little reward saying, hey, I just did that thing and then I made it happen. And I, I kind of feel in the, I fit the same kind of mold where I like to have it in my schedule and in front of my face. So I kind of see it and remind myself there. And we, you know, joke about athletes like writing their goals in their mirror in their bathroom because it's there. They see it every single day. It's a reminder. Hey, here's why I'm up at 530 in the morning when I could be sleeping for another maybe hour before work like this is my reminder that i'm going and doing this and that it's always there and putting it out of the universe typically helps you do that and you know i didn't know you meditated that many times per week i know you did do that but like our sunday miles for you know all fall was the exact same thing it was like hey i'm putting this out there because i know if i don't you'll tell me and hold me accountable and i can hold you right, accountable right. and having those like again going back to the support system we were talking about earlier it's nice to have those things and realizing that you're not in this alone so all these little other things like sleep your fuel your stress like 
use people to like have them help you and you help them back and forth because that reciprocation is going to allow you to do these things that are troubling or hard to do by yourself if you try to tackle them all by yourself so find people to help you with these things and you know work together kind of going what hunter said like have that conversation and get that mutual agreement and say like hey we're both going to be healthier i might be doing it because i want to perform better but all the things that are going to help me perform better might also help you feel less stressed at work the next day or help you deal with this difficult person that you have to deal with at, you know, your job. So these, even if your goal isn't necessarily to be the best athlete you can, there are tenants of this that are going to help you be a better and healthier person. This is kind of what I was thinking about as you were talking with the, you know, the, the shame of someone who's sleeping really well, training really hard, but then has super a lot of stress and can't get it from it. And they're like, Oh, I'm a serious athlete. I don't care. This stuff applies to people, even if they aren't necessarily trying to be of the course. pinnacle of fitness. Yeah. Um, for anyone wondering, I use the waking up app on so it's cool. it's sam harris's thing and the introductory course is cool because it's not a specific type of meditation that he teaches he teaches every type of meditation so that you can kind of find when you're done what type of meditation works best for you nice. um moving on to food now i'm gonna ask you guys a question and um i'm judge and jury it's very subjective Good. What is the number one most important thing that a serious athlete has to do when it comes to nutrition? Hydrate. Well, that's tough because that's not <laughs> real. I was going to ask, does that count? I don't know if that counts. No, it doesn't count. Branch. doesn't count. But you can have another. Uh, I'll say one more. I'm going to say quality. Qual the quality of the food. Yeah. What the when you eat something, think about where did it come from and what kind of life it lived and if it's going to help you be healthy because no. I had a healthy life. No. Damn. And I, you're probably surprised hearing that coming from me, but if you are a serious athlete, we've talked about this before. There is a hierarchy of how these things work, and be, just because one sits above the other doesn't necessarily make it more important. But to me, the number one thing an athlete has to fuel enough. Yeah. I if you, if you train your ass off, if you follow MFT, you do the extras, you're trying to get to semifinals, CrossFit games, and you don't eat enough, talk about cortisol levels, stress, laying awake at night and having no clue why your body won't sleep, all these different things. If you're underfed, is a serious issue. Now, everyone who listened to this podcast knows how we feel about micronutrients, right? Also a non-negotiable to not have, you know, we recommend as a systematic thing, having at least one meal a day where the sole focus or the biggest focus of that meal is the micronutrients, you know, that we still believe in that very much. We do think that's a non-negotiable. If you spread it out throughout all of your meals, cause you just eat a bit cleaner, that's great as well. We just like to give, you know, sort of those check boxes to get through. If you don't eat enough to fuel your efforts, you can't train hard enough. You can't like, it's really important to dial in, you know, what the food is, dial in your macros for, I mean, I'm guessing at this point you're looking at 75% of people in the serious athlete category that weigh and measure their food or at least make an effort to. They have to, but you just can't. I mean, I do. The reason I'm saying that is because I, oh, you're I know. Oh, you're saying 75% weigh and measure? Yes. Oh, yeah. I, I know that. of a lot of high level athletes that don't do that, mm -hmm. but they also did at one point and sort of have this overall general feeling of what a certain food looks like. And they also know what it feels like when they don't get the right thing. So, um, qualify that and say they at some point have, maybe they don't currently do it, but at some point did right. because they want yes. to know how these macronutrients play off one another. I mean, if you're a serious athlete and you don't try something like that, it just doesn't, that doesn't make any sense to me. Like it might not be yeah. for you psychologically. It might be annoying. You might just not be that. Your mind might not work that way. But not knowing generally what you're putting into your you, body you, is going to be learn, a problem. You learn a lot as well. Yeah. Like the it that and that goes to the non-serious athlete when you when as a coach you they want to talk about performing better or losing weight or whatever it is and you you ask well how's your nutrition and they say it's pretty good. And they actually have no idea or when you tell them to start writing it down or putting it into an app and it's just like, hey, yes, that candy bar that you ate from work does in fact count, you know, towards your daily nutritional. <laughs> does that work? Yeah. <laughs> or your 36 <laughs> Butterfingers, whatever it is. Um, and you just, you don't know. Like uh, if you've never, if you've never tracked it, I'd be, 
I don't know. That'd be a cool, that'd be a clever experiment. I haven't, I haven't tracked food in a long time. I'd be curious to see how close I could guess to what my, right. my macro nutrient breakdown and like caloric intake is. But yeah, I, I was going quality or quantity for, for the elite athlete. Absolutely. You have to fuel correctly. And, and I'm sure you would agree. It's not, it's not one or the other. It's not, no, it's not binary. No, no, no. Like so the, so the, these the all eating. are quote unquote non-negotiables, right? Yeah. Um, so we've sort of established you got to eat enough. You have to get enough of the right micronutrients into your body. There are a ton of amazing resources online that literally tell you this micronutrient does this in your body and this is what food it is. So you can start to figure those things out. You can go get blood work done. It is pretty expensive and unfortunately can be a bit of a snapshot in time, but it's better than nothing. You, you know, you can, you can go in and say, wow, my vitamin B levels are, you know, super low. I have sort of been feeling a little sluggish lately and, you know, maybe it's a food thing. Maybe it's a genetic mutation thing there that, you know, different people are going to need to supplement with different things to be able to get to those places. Um, the next question here is, are there non-negotiable supplements? We can talk about ones we like, that's fine, but are there non-negotiable supplements? I yeah, the, uh, the world on fire with this question. People would tell you, oh, "No, you gotta eat real food. You can get all of it there." Uh, the best part of the, the, those conversations, though, is neither side is right because they yeah. treat it as if it's either this. It or has that. to be A or B. That's not how that works. I, I would, I would say, protein, carb, creatine, non-negotiable. You're not you. You are not going to be able to train, um, and then. I, okay, I'm not. It, it will be. It would be difficult for you to be in the gym for multiple hours, multiple sessions, or even one or two sessions, train, and then be ingesting something that meets the kind of criteria that we maybe we'll get into the you know protein and carb with no fat, um, and then understanding like all three of those things can be can be achieved by eating real food. But I, I would say that as far as when we're talking about bioavailability and just the, the kind of immediate need to replenish and, and restore muscle glycogen and just start tissue repair, I, I, would, I would say that for the elite level athlete, protein, carb, creatine is a, is a requirement. You could probably get into like the, some other fenugreek extracts, I feel like pink the, salt, the <laughs> little extra leucine, <laughs> digestive enzymes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the two that came to my mind, I, I feel like the protein and carbs can more or less be hit with food if you, again, you take the time to really like... The focus carbs on. maybe, but man, the protein and especially because of the density, like whey protein is, it's just protein, right? And how hard is it to yeah. get just protein and then you mix it with water and when it goes down into your stomach, that surface area, it just gets absorbed. Like when you have like complex protein structures, you know, if you looked at it under a microscope and there's lines going in every direction, your body has to break those tissues down to then be able to absorb them. Are you going to be able to throw down a few chicken breast with no fat? Like, like, I mean, I mean, a, a little bit of fat wouldn't be a big deal, but no, out, basically no, boys, you're going to be able to do that pepper. <laughs> upwards of 10 times a week. You're going to be able to knock those bad boys down. Sure. Yeah. Doc, I, I mean, 36, off, Dr. Butterfinger. Better off eating 36 Butterfingers. You know what's fucked up is the answer for him might be yes. Yeah. That's like terrible. when we used to talk about it and I'm like, I have to go home and eat a bag of shrimp because I didn't hit my protein <laughs> today. And he goes, I do that all the time. I'm like, that is insane. Our, there was a go-to for a while where I was working with someone that was a little bit more on the high carb yeah. end. And it almost every single night ended with one of those like Louisiana shrimp frozen like bags God and fucking like two damn it. scoops of cooked rice. No. Like one full bag, two scoops of cooked rice. You're looking at like 60 or 70 grams of protein and like, I don't know, 120 damn. grams of protein of uh carbs and just sitting there like in how much barbecue bowl? sauce would i need to ingest oh, to I take down like 70 grams of protein i love shrimp I, I, so I, do i, I. I, could, I yes. could probably eat like a bag of a bag of but like, what i'm saying is how many days how, in a row <laughs> how many days in a row <laughs> yeah. are you gonna get after that yeah that's why what was the other one that you were gonna so, so the two things i were gonna say like i i think the protein and carbs again depending on again your version digestibility and the fact that you need to be able to come in and the athletes we're talking to typically are 
double or triple sessions, depending on what time of year it mm-hmm. is. Like they need to be able to get that in there, recharge your body, synthesize it for the next session that you're about to get to versus like the healthy person and just looking to get fit a little bit different conversation, but the two hour we're going to say something anti-inflammatory. So like one thing that you've told me a long time ago is that cod liver oil, because there are, there are fermented cod liver oil, excuse me, from like Amazon. There's a, a really nice one there. Casey. It tastes horrible. It tastes worse than you think it does. It too. tastes horrible, <laughs> but at the same time, yeah, fermented cod, cod liver oil. oil. <laughs> Every word. Cigarettes at the end. <laughs> cod liver oil. Cod liver oil. Oh my <laughs> God. I'd rather drink Ray's piss jug. Uh, <laughs> but what I was going to say there is like, you know, we talk about how stressful training is and if this helps you with, you know, inflammation allows you to recover better and potentially helps build the basis for some of your um, fat based hormones. Like that would be super helpful. So the two that I were going to say were creatine and something anti-inflammatory like a fermented cut liver oil, like either dropper or supplement just because of the creatine being more like, Hey, help produce energy and get my muscles stronger. And then I got something for recovery on the other side. So kind of giving like an A and B like during training and then post training of two things that would help you right i mean i feel like people are going to know my answer it's like one of my life goals to start a company that had a post-workout shake that had everything in it that i think it should Mm -hmm. so like that happened because i wanted that product and i wanted to be able to like really like trust the answer i was giving like when you're telling one of your members like a part of your community to go purchase something this is something about it that feels a little off especially if you're the one who well yeah, see, keep, see keep going, I feel yeah, I feel better about this exactly. because I yeah. know yeah. I know exactly yeah. what it is. So so that sort of sets the standard there. Um, from the anti-inflammatory standpoint, the go-tos are collagen and some sort of curcumin, turmeric kind of thing. Just from a scientific standpoint, like there aren't that many supplements where they go in and try to measure true like inflammation response where they can replicate these things changing. So those would be the two go-tos there. I don't know if it's okay for me to say that those are non-negotiables. Like I said, we can talk about the supplements that we think are super important. Um, I don't know necessarily that those are non-negotiable, um, but I'm sure it's all going to recommend them to just about everybody. And every time someone comes to me and says, you know, Hey, this hurts, that hurts. I can't seem to, I can't seem to shake it. What should I do? Um, the other thing that I would throw in here is something that signals that switch to, you know, the, the rest and digest portion of our autonomic nervous system. So we've talked about this before sponsor of the podcast, but I'll like a very high dose of CBD does a really good job of doing that. It's something it's something to me that that is important to talk about because you can f- sort of feel it happening if you do take it in the right doses. Unfortunately, right now, because it's such a buzzword and because the market is so saturated, you could go to a store and and look at how much you're actually getting in a dropper of some of these products, and it's not going to do anything noticeable. It might work on a cellular level. It might do some of the brain healing stuff. But a lot of people, like if you're going to put your hard earned money into a supplement, that's how you're going to be able to like feel it. You know what I mean? And high dose CBD is something that you can truly feel. And again, like something like that, something like, um, you know, I I really like the four Sigmatic products they have, and it's basically just the, the different, you know, mushrooms that, that you would use for certain benefits. And I believe, damn it, I'm going to mess this up. I think the I think the relaxing one is Rishi. I think turkey tail is <laughs> immune system. Lion's mane is the shit that I'm on right now and why I'm talking so fast. Um, and I think I Rishi that. is the like chill, like relaxed kind of thing. So something like that. that. You see colors. <laughs> and then you could go to I something like colors. a like a natural calm, like you know you take your Epsom salt bath or take you know a higher dose magnesium type supplement like that. I think it's important to have something like that go to when your nervous system is just you've had that day. We just asked you not to have. 
what can you do to signal it's time to chill the fuck out? I, I would definitely like echo that sentiment of make sure you get a good one out. Cause the first thing I, you said when you were like looking for a CBD product, cause they're all like a buzzword right now and everyone's got one is going back to like the old level one where they're like, Hey, get this much EPA and DHA from your fish oil supplement. And you had to take like 600 pills from like, swim in it. <laughs> with you do the beer fest. You get, get you drowning. You and then you a three pound down. salmon. <laughs> this, this said 30 servings, but I ate the entire bottle in one setting. <laughs> like, like that's the way to get the DHA and, and uh, EPA. So like just echoing that sentiment, try to find one that has a decent amount in the, you know, the black label from pure spectrum works really well for me. It's one of my like go-to winding down things before bed under the tongue, wait a minute, brush your teeth, go to sleep. So yeah. I really do like it. I think the, the inflammatory ones a good, just kind of wrap back around just for a second. You, we alluded to like the, uh, a food sensitivity test or something like that. You can learn what you might need to add right. or Absolutely. take yeah, away from your call. diet to understand what kind of inflammation you're uh you're experiencing so you might not know like i've never and I it can be health foods too like right it's one of those things either a health food or what the general public considers a health food yeah, i haven't like flounder i can't have flounder it sucks <laughs> you fucking idiot. Okay. how many flounders could you eat in five minutes <laughs> i could eat less flounders than butterfingers for sure I haven't taken one because I'm afraid it'll tell me that I shouldn't eat eggs. I can tell you can eat peanut butter and you can't snack on it before the meeting. I'll still fucking snack, Ted. Don't think I won't <laughs> snack on peanut butter just because it's going to kill me. Ted hopes it says every food on it so Hunter can't <laughs> chew anywhere near him for the rest of his life. Um, all right. Two, two, two more quick things. Uh, is fasting non-negotiable? Ooh, buzzword and controversy. And I, think I, it's, say yes. I think it's non-negotiable, but for less time than like is beneficial for the general population. I think the application and understanding how it and why it works is what matters mm -hmm. for these athletes. So like we talk about, hey, there needs to be the other side of the coin. You train really, really hard. You need to have recovery periods, you know, an active recovery day, a full rest day. Those are the days these type of protocols make the most amount of sense because we talk about all the benefits, including like autophagy and like how your insulin responds after fasting. Like if you can teach yourself to understand how to use the tissue that's on you, AKA your fat cells, your energy cells, if you can teach your body how to do that on your active recovery or your rest day, then fasting has a very good place for you and makes a lot of sense. Are you someone that trains three times a day and fasts for the entire day during your three session and then try to scarf it all down at the end of the night? Absolutely Good not. Idea. So it's just knowing the right application for these things. And like, I personally fast most days, 16 hours. There was a point where I was doing a 24 hour fast every Monday and I've kind of gotten away with that, but I still was sick, sick with the 16 hour fast. And I do think for athletes of the highest caliber, there are one or two days per week that you can fit this kind of idea in your schedule. But like you said, you might go 12 and 12 or 14 and 10 or maybe even 16 and eight, but you probably want to stick away from a lot of 24 hour fasts unless you're in the off season. Yeah, I don't think a, a 12 hours isn't super difficult. I don't think that's always like it's an more, easy a, place a, more to a start scheduling thing. concern. People just a, don't notice that they're ingesting calories. It's in a those scheduling moments. thing. And like from a training standpoint, you kind of hit on it, but you can't do fasted cardio if you're not fasting. I right. you know there's a lot of benefits to that. And as far as learning learning how to uh, use a different fuel source from from your body, and you know, anytime we go, anytime you go long, you it, it's nice to be able to to flip that switch or have that reserve fuel store. So, not not yeah. I, I also do the 16 hours 16 hours most days. The occasional 24 hour more often. A lot of times that's unintentional, uh, but I, th I think, yeah, I, I would say 12. I think 12 is fine for the elite athlete. Twelve, Do the 12 and 12, and then maybe on the rest day, it's a 14. All right, so we're, we're going to move on to a more contra even more controversial Ooh. topic. And I'm going to address this. What sort of shoes should I use yeah, when I do a my snatching? Nanos for lifting. Should I change my <laughs> shoes in the middle of you the You should workout? shock your shoes. Shock if you're gonna do your real shoes. <laughs> Okay, Fuck. this <laughs> final dildo food shock your shoes in a competition comment <laughs> is <laughs> the <asshat>. ecosystem <laughs> of Sorry. the amount of food you eat, energy balance, performance in different categories, oh, no. weightlifting, gymnastics, whatever, in relationship to your body weight. How much? Hold on, my flow chart's all fucked now. What? Oh, How much do you need to, as a serious athlete, pay attention to? Not only this food is making me 
feel this way, look this way, whatever that. it is, do all oh. of these things. But then like, I know for me personally, when I did not know that I had celiac, it was impossible for me to gain weight. It didn't matter what I ate. It just increased my trips to the John. When I Who's got, when, when, when I figured that out and started adding weight somewhat rapidly, I took it to the point where ring dips were not fun, right? <laughs> and you got to think about the idea of what, you know, strength to body weight ratio, all of these different things. There's, you know, again, the, the issue with this conversation is, are we talking about the general public? Are we talking about, you know, body image issues and all of that? No, we're talking about physics. We're talking about your performance might feel better. You might start, you know, putting in more fat and carbs into your diet and you just demolish assault bike workouts and you're deadlifting more or whatever. And then you get to the open and your chest to bar have taken a hit or your muscle ups or your handstand mm -hmm. push ups or whatever it is. Um, you know, is it just one of those things where we're saying it's mandatory to pay attention to it, to, to keep track of how these different things change when your body weight changes? I think, thankfully, most athletes at that highest level notice those things. And I remember having conversations with China Cho a while back when she was trying something particular different with her macros. And she goes, man, I, I don't feel the same way when I was running or I don't feel the same way when I was doing my toe to bar or bar muscle up, something like that. So right. I think certain athletes, obviously, re they respond to foods in different ways. So there's no like cast the wand and this is how everyone should eat type of deal. But um, yeah, you should 100% pay attention to those things. If you notice that you decide to add a little more fat to your diet and all of a sudden your running splits get slower, well, shit, maybe you don't do that. Or there are times of the year where it makes sense to have a little bit more. Maybe cycle one comes back around or phase one comes back around and it's all lifting. Hey, maybe it's okay to have a little Jesus. bit more protein Flashback. and carbohydrate because you're trying to put spot. some mass on. But some people, other times of the year, that doesn't make sense. Who wants to be 10 pounds extra heavy when it comes time to do toe to bar, bar muscle ups and things like that? Doesn't make sense. So I think there are ebbs and flows that occur in the season and there are times where you can kind of experiment with other styles of eating. But like when the open's coming back up or your season's coming back up, you should have those things hopefully dialed in from the time leading up to those events to be know how those affect you. Yeah, I'm upset. That wasn't as controversial as I thought it would be. You made it sound I'm like, just, I I'm, don't think, I don't think it's, I think it's, it yeah, would be I controversial if we said men should weigh this much, women should, <laughs> yeah. should weigh this much. <laughs> yeah. And this is what you're going to get because obviously people have different energy systems, different muscle fiber type breakdowns, all of this different stuff. What, to me becomes non-negotiable is understanding the give and take yeah. of an energy surplus of having, I mean, it, a lot of times, you know, some of these people that we're talking about that aren't great at body weight stuff, they're fucking jacked. Like we're not talking about someone who has a body image issue in terms of, you know, I got way too much fat on my body. Yeah. It's one of those things where they they can't, can't stop trying to add as much mass as they can. So like for me, again, the idea of the non-negotiable here is understanding the give and take of weighing more, weighing less, energy surplus, you know, all of this stuff. You have to take that seriously as an athlete. And to me, a lot of it's just sort of about keeping it in the back of your mind and thinking about it yeah. when you're training. I think it's just, yeah, it's just paying attention to it. It's under, also, you have to understand that uh, food isn't going to be the only thing that impacts that stuff. We talked a lot about stress and sleep and all of those things are going to play into whether you're storing fat or your, you know, your energy stores are being used for, for exercise versus being stored in like fat tissue. So I think it's more about understanding how you perform and, and kind of basically like learning what is your, what is your optimal body weight for what you're trying to compete for compete at and like we could even we could even go as far as saying like you you might have a different body weight for like the open versus an athlete who's going to the games like that those things might be different if you're getting really into the weeds with a super high level athlete but i think it's more just paying attention and understanding how your body responds and and how you feel and what you're willing to you know sacrifice like oh yeah i can my my running or rowing splits are a lot better, but I a set of ten chest to bar pull ups and like we're in, we're in some we're in a world it of hurt. Seems to me again and again, probably you guys would both agree. We're just taking another step back and opening up the lens that we're looking through and realizing that there are more things that have that move the needle in your fitness and that you can measure and track those things and see how they affect your ability to perform. Because a lot of times people look at performance kind of in a small bubble of like, hey, I slept well, so I trained well. 
But these are other elements to your overall fitness that can be measured and managed and say, all right, when I do this, how do I feel there? And one thing we're always talking with athletes is realize that your training experiences can be then called upon down the road, knowing what you operate at for an optimal body weight or how you feel when you need to be able to, be able to run well or swim well or lift heavy. Those are things we want athletes to know. And it's important to realize that there are going to be gives and take, giving and taking that comes occur, that occurs when you're doing things like playing with your macros or working on a running phase or doing these other things. But having that lens and being able to step back a little bit and saying, all right, I now know more about myself, which is, I feel like the real overarching message here is like, know yourself and know how your body reacts to certain inputs and outputs, and then use that to your advantage to be the best and fittest person you can be. So to me, it's just realizing that there's more to it than just the X's and O's and what your times and splits were in your Metcons, but lifestyle stuff plays maybe more of an important role in your overall picture than how you did from day to day in training. All right. Um, this next one changes in a very big way when it comes to um, serious athlete, quote unquote, and that is movement. So it changes because if we got to convince you to do fucking aerobic work or, or, you know, do your stretching or your mobility at this point, maybe I think you slide out of that category. True. 100%. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, yeah. like essentially immediately. So, so, so the idea of you need to get your lifting in, you need your Metcons, your intervals, your, at this point, if we're talking to, to this group of people, man, you got some really serious shit to take care of outside of this entire conversation. You got some podcasts to listen to. <laughs> yes. And non-exercise movement, which is sort of the basis of what we're going to talk about now, has a different connotation when it comes to a super high-level athlete. If I sit down on the assault bike for 40 to 60 minutes, it's going to have a much different physiological response even at a very controlled, nice and easy pace than it would if Caroline did it, right? Mm -hmm. Different things are going to happen within our body. My body's going to be like, damn, getting getting after it today, huh? <laughs> and hers is going to be like, oh, this is amazing. We're, you know, flushing waste. We're doing all these things. So the context of this conversation becomes different just based on the idea that it's a serious athlete. So um, non-negotiables inside of the, you know, sort of bubble that I created. Yeah, the, the non-exercise movement, just again, promoting the ability to get into that rest and digest and that parasympathetic and that typically when we say non-exercise movement, we're talking go for a walk, go for a hike, maybe ride a bike if it's warm or go for a swim. Like these things promote recovery and promote range of motion, all things athletes need to be concerned with 24-7. So to me, you know, uh, creating the, the situation where you go out and do things that are non-exercise you know, five or seven days, five to seven days a week. It's, it's important. And you best part about this is it does not need to be done all at once. And I think that's the hurdle people have to get over. It's that you don't need to go just walk 15 minutes in one direction, turn around at the 15 minute mark and walk 15 minutes back. You can split these up. I do a, recommend it though. I mean, it's a great way to do it, but there's, there's, there's ways to split this up to make it more manageable, easier yeah. to stomach that you're not being like, oh fuck it. Like I haven't walked outside for the last four days. I got to make up two hours of non-exercise movement. Like start simple, start with five minutes of a walk and then a 10 minute walk and a 15 minute walk. But like the amount of recovery it promotes and the ability to get into a calm head space. There are all these other things that we've been talking about already that can be achieved in non-exercise movement that make it so valuable and that, you know, we talk to athletes like, you know, one of the great things for Austin right now is his job's manual labor. It's physical. And I would bet he would say to you that he feels better on average, just in emotionally, physically, because he's moving throughout the day versus a job where you, you know, sit behind a counter and say, you know, what do you want with that kind of deal? Like that's a much different situation. Damn. You'd be amazing at customer. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the, the difference is that for all for us specifically going non-exercise movement is is exactly that or it's like it might it might be a training day for you like that that's part of your training whereas for to me for a high level athlete yes the recovery side of things is super important but it's more of a a stress thing for me i think the going out for a walk you know disconnecting from your devices and just getting outside along with kind of the the fresh air the vitamin d all of those things but um the the stress is what what kind of came to mind first so whether that is just going for a walk or maybe it's doing something that you really enjoy doing uh going for a bike rides swimming for me it's surfing uh 
going skiing in the winter or something like that and and having that um just kind of like time to relax and not don't even think about it as like using your fitness or like a like oh how high did i get my heart rate think you, you have to frame it as more of like this is contributing to my recovery my mental state my stress levels those sorts of things that's a good way to think of it what's very interesting is i was going to address that i that with a serious athlete i don't believe that the like the mode of non-exercise movement has to be something outside of the gym and then i changed my opinion when you were talking about what you were talking about so like for me i started just from the place of flushing waste and doing your you know your stretching your rom mod your recovery protocols you need those things to be able to get rid of the crap you put into your body by training either the day before or that day um you know sort of the the, the flushing the blood flow all of these things that's the non-negotiable, but when you talk about being able to hit two birds with one stone and say, yes, I'm flushing waste and I found that thing that brings me back up into the stress category that allows me to get out of this boom, boom, boom on all the time kind of mindset, which you would guess might take over in an athlete when they're in the gym, right? Mm. You know, you're on the bike yeah. and you're like, really? A 215? Yeah, like, really? Exactly. And that is exactly yeah. what we are looking for. When we ask for a flush, when we ask for the forever pace, you know, these sort of things, we are asking for something that you could do indefinitely. Like you show up at the games and Castro says, you're getting on the rower and I'm going to tell you get a, to get off the rower in a few hours here. We'll see. I'll tell you when to get off. That'd be so, fucking oh great. Oh, that would be great. I love that. Oh, Indefinite yeah. amount of time. Yeah. Do you sprint at the beginning though? Okay, that's a totally different. Rate. That's <laughs> that rabbit hole is just too much. I wanted Castro to be back at the start line and be like, again. <laughs> but for the whole, <laughs> just her Brooks with a whistle, just <laughs> again. But but for the whole Frazier comes by and it's just like Mike Rizzioni. <laughs> <laughs> you imagine Atlanta twice? Oh my um, god. Come yeah. Backwards. So so <laughs> non-exercise movement we have established depending on how an athlete categorizes this, is the non-negotiable here. You cannot train your ass off and then go sit down. You're going to have back problems. You're going to have hip issues. Your knees are going to bother you. Shoulders, all these things. We have to go through easy guy. You know, these me out like passive <laughs> ranges of motion. We have to move our body like a human being when there's not this massive amount of resistance on our bodies, either created by how hard we're running or by the weight that's on our back. So, um, yeah, that's that's a that's a really good point to say. Maybe it is a non-negotiable for a lot of serious athletes to save time by being able to combine those two things: stress and, relief yeah, and, I think the, and the movement. The the in gym thing, we you kind of hit on it, but it if if you are that type of person who's ultra competitive, it's really fucking hard to sit on the rower, sit on a bike, and be like, like you said, like really, like a two fifteen, like all right, we'll just go, let's just go down to like a two two ten. Right. Like, all right, you no, know, let's let's make sure we only see the ones, and all of a sudden it's a training piece. You you go outside something that's that's almost not measurable, or you treat it as you know not a training piece is like a mandatory mandatory de-stress session just call it something different right that i think i think that's important i'm a big fan of not looking at a screen for the non-exercise <laughs> i mean yeah even, I, 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 really I, don't, I am by no means a competitive athlete but i'll i i'll do that like i'll put that in my head be like okay just don't see this number like have a little bit of dignity right but it's the same like, exact way it'll be a pretty low i do the same dignity, thing but, but i'm not willing to admit what those numbers are right. yeah, same. Uh, on the internet yeah all right, uh, you know what time it is. It's final thoughts time. We've covered a lot of topics. Now you need to synthesize all of it, and you can't talk for more than 30 seconds. I'm just kidding. Is there anything that you feel like hit home to a point where you're like, yeah, that's that's definitely something that, that – you know, we need to be making sure we're talking to our athletes the, more on yeah, a the, regular basis. The, for me, the underlying one is – is what we started with and that's yeah. just i addressing stole my our, idea both our own <laughs> both both our like our personal relationships and just kind of setting the expectation with one yourself and then two with those around you so that you do have the uh the support for the duration of time that you need and then there's that there's the side that the the requirement for you the obligation for you to don't be a dick 
uh, like these people, if if you are so fortunate that you have the support system that is going to support all of these nitpicky things, because you have to remember you're a fucking weirdo. If you're <laughs> if you're if you're that elite athlete who's chasing and you're in the the top, no, I mean you are. You, I know what you, you are. Mean. I'm you know, don't be a dick, Hunter. You're the you're the weirdo. Um, you are asking for for people to understand something that they might not fully. Um, and to just kind of trust you. So you need to reciprocate that uh, in the same way. And and don't think of that as like a like a payment that is that that is going to create the positive feedback loop that we talked about. And for me, having that kind of baseline makes all the other things a lot easier to to fall into place naturally. I really liked your point of the the communication with the the spouse or the boyfriend, girlfriend or the people in your community. Like I agree. Like it's important. It's on you to put it out in the universe and say, I'm about this. But like having that conversation is something that probably would have saved me a headache. I don't know, 10 years ago when I tried to be competitive in CrossFit. But to, for me, I, I think that the, if I wasn't going to use the communication as my, like my final thought, it's just that positivity, like put out into the world, what you want to receive back. And I know that you, how do I put out positive vibes in my sleep? Well, I don't know about that, but in terms of like asking yourself, what about this, the habits that I'm creating are going to make a positive mark on my sleep. Then I can kind of frame it in the positive and negative light. So for me, put, put out positivity because that's how you're going to get it back into your life. And that's going to set you up in the best case scenario to have lower stress and allow these other things that we talked about that are all interconnected to kind of play out in the best possible scenario. Fair. All right. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm going to take kind of the easy route here, but it's just the idea of the whole entire basis for this conversation. You guys, I mean, everyone listening to this podcast, right? I mean, you guys work, they work so hard in the gym and there's varying levels of that. There's your affiliate athlete, hatchet, MFT, the whole teens and masters, the whole deal. The common theme is that anyone who knows about this podcast, listens to it, works their ass off. And if you don't think about this other side of the situation, you know, pissing in the wind, right? Like Our heart you, goes you, out to you. We feel bad for you that you're not taking that serious. Well, that's not what pissing in the wind means. But what I'm, you're working very hard and you're not getting the returns that you should for your hard work. You're self-sabotaging. And you might not know it, and these might be new topics for you. But it's just so important. Obviously, we're talking about serious athletes, so 23 hours is not the right terminology. Who knows? I mean, it's also the other 18 hours or whatever it is. Yeah. The hours that you're not dedicating yourself to clean and jerk, snatch, muscle up, row, bike, you need to be dedicating yourself to stress relief and fueling yourself properly. Just doing all of these things because again, it's much harder to you know get after it out in the gym than it is to check off some of these boxes right mm -hmm. it's just one of those things where if you're going to take it really seriously you got to find a way to systemize it a little bit you got to find a way to make sure you're thinking about these things simple not easy <laughs> all right ladies and gents thank you for tuning in to another episode of the misfit podcast thank you to our show sponsors properfuel.co use the code word misfit to save on your very first jug of proper recovery that we sort of hinted at you might want to try here a few mm -hmm. times not so subtly in the episode purespectrumcbd.com use the code word misfit to save not so subtly brought up the cbd as well but we believe in both of those things so that's why we're affiliated with them and last but not least, sharpentheaxco.com. Use the code word unprepared or the code word Kiala, K-E-A-L-A, -E to save 10% and to donate 10% of your order amount to the Kiala Foundation. As always, I'm at Misfit Coach on Instagram. Slide into those DMs. Let us know what you thought about the episode and what you would like to hear next. Oh.